Uh, is my screen shared? Not yet, not yet. You need just to double click on the screen. Loading, sir. Not yet. Okay. So, you can share your screen, share this board. Okay. Can I share it with Lisa? Yes. Okay. Can I share it with Lisa? Uh, for the screen, but I... uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, my pleasure in Akuma Hadat Kunaharda, my pleasure in Nahna Nasul Hailin Dul, Mutasim Funeratology, Full Hetam Masr, Alam Funeratology. Thank you for coming and for sharing uh, our experience. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. My talk today is about neonatal hypoglycemia. And we don't know exactly normal blood glucose range A. And what is the definition of hypoglycemia, which determines the absolute clinical risk? Well, individualized approach to management of neonatal hypoglycemia takes into account patient safety and family preferences. Actually, in Europe and in the UK, 63 milligram per cent of blood glucose is recommended in hyperinsulinemic infants or babies. The physiology in the fetus, in the fetus, actually, there's constant glucose infusion. This is maintained by the placenta, and the gluconeogenic enzymes are low, and the adipose tissue formed in the last trimester and the glycogen in the last months. But at pairs, there is abrupt cessation of glucose supply. Glucose levels decrease over the first uh, two to four hours, and the homeostatic enzymes, hormones, receptors become functioning, and feeding is established. From pairs to healthy neonate, there is a counter hormones that become active, and glucose is one of the most important hormones. Adrenaline has an action, and growth hormone as well, and there is a fall in insulin levels. Induction of gluconeogenic and gluconeogenesis and ketogenesis and lipolysis. There is a decrease in blood glucose level countered by a rapid increase in fatty acid and ketone bodies, and the glucose level stabilizes in four to six hours, and glycogen storage are depleted. About 18% of babies' blood glucose level less than 36.8 mg per deciliter in the first three days. There is an alternative fuels in the, in the form of ketones and lactate. And low blood glucose is uncommon if babies are more than three days. In breastfeed infant, lower blood glucose is expected and the increased incidence of hypoglycemia and glucose less than 46.8 milligram per deciliter. There is an increase for ketone bodies and the increase for ketogenic response. In day six, the similar postprandial glucose increase. Well, term babies rarely develop symptomatic hypoglycemia. A symptomatic healthy newborn, term infant, term babies of normal birth weight do not require glucose monitoring. And symptomatic hypoglycemia in term babies should be considered always pathological. 
In the very term, and this is GE babies, the condition is different. There is less ability to mobilize the alternative fibers. Insulin may not be suppressed. Hypoglycemia common, but rare with adequate intake of glucose 6 to 8 milligram per, per kg per minute. In other words, more than, more than 120 mg per kg per day. Interfeeding enhances the metabolic adaptation, encouraging the first feeding and adequate enteral nutrition or enteral feed prevent enteral venous therapy. Actually, since 1937, we are looking for definition of hypoglycemia, what is mild, what is moderate, what is severe. The values were from 40 to 50, the mild ones, the moderate from 20 to 40, and the extreme is less than 20 milligram per deciliter. Since 1958, it was 20 up to 1999 and 2009, perhaps 60 milligram per deciliter. So the, everything is changing, but the cutoff values, the exact values, we don't know yet. The glucose at which hypoglycemia exists is unknown, but in vulnerable babies, blood glucose should be kept more than 46.8 milligram per deciliter. And if there is a lack of alternative fuels, it should be more than 55 milligram per deciliter. There is infant risk factors for developing neonatal hypoglycemia, maternal risk factors and neonatal ones. Maternal risk factors, maternal diabetes, preeclampsia, previous microsomic infants, substance abuse, there is a beta agonist toxicolytic and treatment with oral hypoglycemic agents. And the neonatal conditions, prematurity, IUGR, asphyxia, ischemia, hypoxic syndicalopathy, sepsis, hypothermia, polycythemia, erythrocytosis fetalis, and et cetera, and bone nerve metabolism and the endocrinological cause as well. Why blood glucose supply important to the brain? The brain actually, the blood glucose uptake rates of the neonate are high, about 60 or 70%, four to five milligram per kg per minute body weight, or most of the whole blood glucose rate. Alternatively, substances as ketones and lactate are low in IUGR and SCGE, and, but it is variable in IDM. Clinical signs of low glucose, Concentration, clinical signs caused by low blood glucose improves with glucose. Organic causes of hypoglycemia that lead to brain injury have glucose values less than 25 milligram per deciliter intermittently, but for a prolonged period. So it makes sense to keep blood glucose above this value. In hyperinsulinism, this is an excessive glucose utilization. And in metabolic block, fatty acid, oxidative, fatty acid oxidative disorders, there is also excessive glucose utilization and the hypoglycemia inadequate glucose production. The resistant uh, hyperinsulinism may be severe and may lead to neurological injury. New needs with the repeated market prolonged, but we don't know exactly how, for how long. And what is the blood glucose value that could bring injury? We don't know. The rate with intravenous glucose will stabilize the baby. Signs of illness and or hypoglycemia should be considered as a serious conditions. We have to maintain blood glucose value, particularly in hyperinsulinism. We have to establish enteral feeding as early as we can at least two, one or two days before discharge. We know discharge for an infant with recurrent or low blood glucose, and it has, it has to be stable for one or two days with normal blood glucose before feed. So what, we, what should we do? Healthy full-term born infant with no clinical signs don't, don't require any glucose monitoring. Breastfeed infants usually have lower blood glucose concentration, but their higher ketone bodies or higher ketone concentration suggests that this, this is normal and lower blood glucose by 10 milligram per deciliter doesn't affect. Healthy breastfeed infants don't 
require glucose monitoring. And this is the guidelines for the, for the American Academy of Pediatrics for infants with ECGE or little GE preterm. If the baby is symptomatic and less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, intravenous blood glucose should be given. But if asymptomatic in the first, uh, um, in the first hour, in the first four hours of age, we have to uh, feed him within one hour. And we have to screen blood glucose 30 minutes after the first fit. If it is less than 25 milligram per deciliter, we have to feed the baby and recheck in one hour as well. And it, but if it is still less than 25 milligram per deciliter, intravenous, blood, intravenous glucose should be given. But if it is from 25 to 40 milligram per deciliter, either refeed or we give intravenous glucose. From four hours to 24 hours, we have to continue feeding every two to three hours and the screen prior to each feed. If it is less than 35 milligram per percent, we give intravenous blood glucose. If it is from 35 to 45, refeed or intravenous blood glucose as needed. A target blood glucose should be more than 45 milligram per deciliter before a routine feeds. Intravenous glucose monitoring looks like oxygen, uh, oxygen saturation device. Uh, it, it's continuous monitoring for blood glucose for the baby, so we can understand what's going on inside around the clock. Treatment of hypoglycemia. We have to anticipate hypoglycemia depending on the risk factors for the maternal conditions and neonatal conditions as well. To start management early, early identification of infant at risk, at risk effect for development of hypoglycemia, who led us to start prophylactic measures and prevent the occurrence with, with the best treatment for this disorder. Good objectives and to keep blood glucose concentration to normal values and to maintain blood glucose in normal range as well after maintenance of blood glucose. Treatment in asymptomatic but high risk breast feeding or bottle feeding, repeat blood glucose before the next feed. If blood glucose is low, but the baby appears healthy, there are or blood glucose 200 milligram per kg. There is no evidence that asymptomatic hypoglycemia will benefit from treatment. This is a this is a combination of American Academy of Pediatrics in 2011. But we have to consider sepsis in the first diagnosis, interventricular hemorrhage, electrolyte and abnormalities, and most neonatal illnesses. Investigation, we have to calculate glucose GIR, glucose infusion rate. We have to confirm low blood glucose by glucose oxidase, and we have to measure glucose 6 phosphate dehydration. There's a clinical clues to examination. If he's macrosomic, or if there is a feature of Picus Bittman syndrome, or midline defects, or micropenis and joints. Managing fibroglycemia, slow intravenous glucose, ten, uh, dextrose 10%, 2 mg per kg, glucose infusion, at least 5 mg per kg per minute, which is equivalent to 72 mg per kg per day. Fibroglycemia is not controlled. We increase the rate of glucose infusion, but we have to be aware of the excess fluids. And if the concentration is, if the concentration is more than 12.5 milligram per deciliter, we have to put central venous line. If there is difficult venous access, we give glucagon 100 to 200 mg per kg, either IM or IV or subcutaneous. We have to be aware of rebound hypoglycemia, and we may use high boost up or glucose polymer, one mg per kg. Enteral feeding, one mil of milk, the calories is more than one mil of glucose 10%. Enteral feeding establishes normal hormonal regulation of glucose. Breastfeed babies have a better ketogenic response than in formula. Once the blood glucose is normal, increase the feed and reduce the infusion. 
in hyperinsulinemic infants, the commonest pathological cause of neutral hypoglycemia and the most serious. Sometimes it is transient, sometimes it is very resistant. And the very resistant, we call it congenital hyperinsulinism of infants, CHI. And the investigation which should be done for CHI is for the blood, glucose, uh, insulin, ketone bodies, and spray fatty acids, lactate by your weight, or this is the hormone, the session to free T4, ammonia, amino acid, and acyl carnitine profile. And then the urine, we have to measure the ketones, reducing substance, organic acids, and amino acids. Management, we have to calculate the glucose infusion rate daily. Keep blood glucose more than 63 milligram per deciliter, and this is a recommendation everywhere particularly for severe hyperinsulinism. Central venous line access, buccal glucose polymer, and glucagon IM or IV, I will sub to you in emergency. And then intravenous blood glucose to maintain glucose more than 63 milligram per deciliter. And if blood glucose infusion is more than milligram per kg per minute, drugs may be needed for other models. Management, once blood glucose is stable, more than 63 milligrams per deciliter, we have to introduce continuous frequent bolus feeds slowly and the increase interval between feeds and should be able to go four to six hours between feeds before discharge. And we have to do controlled fasting and consider corn starch. Discharge plan, glucagon should be available with the family. That's what I usually do in my hostel. And there, is a, there should be a flow chart with glucose level and its management. For management of congenital hyperinsulinism of infancy, medication, diazoxide is the drug of choice. Close aside, we have to be aware of uh, fluid balance and blood pressure. Nifidibine, octreotide, and surgery in conditions, if they are not responding to high dose of oral medications, particularly diazoxide, and we have to be aware of following the surgery for uh, the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency or exocrine failure. Conclusion, it's a term appropriate AGA neonate don't require any screening for hypoglycemia because it's common for surgical conditions. Blood glucose may be low in the first few days, unlikely to be important because of high levels of alternative metabolic fuel. First fed results is more rapid postnatal adaptation to physiological hypoglycemia. No, ev no evidence that long feed interval is detrimental. If symptomatic, look and treat the cause. We have to anticipate and prevent hypoglycemia in vulnerable or high risk units. We have to feed them regularly, first feeding and may require supplementation. We have to be kept warm because cold can cause hypoglycemia, and we have to measure blood glucose regularly before we feed. We have, we have to stop monitoring once the baby is stable. I would like to introduce some of my patients. I am, I've seen them in the last few years. This is the first patient. He's born in 2029. Antenatal history was unremarkable, but the parents were consanguine parents, and the first baby died, perhaps due to hypoglycemia. There was four terms, CS, no history of asphyxia, nor delayed carriage. Day one and day two, he was normal. In day three, the baby had convulsions, very decorated desaturation to coma. Blood glucose was six milligrams per deciliter. Glucose infusion, 2 ml per kg, glucose 10%, bolus followed by glucose infusion, and the rate increased to 10 mg per kg per minute due to difficulty to control hypoglycine. Day four, oral bottle feeding in addition to glucose 10% infusion. Day five and six, you found this. Day seven generalized fits concomitant with hypoglycemia, despite of the intravenous glucose infusion rate was about 15 milligram per kg per minute and oral feeding as well. Second week, 
look at 1.5 IM with good initial response. And after that, I started at those of 5 microgram BKG every six hours. Examination wasn't remarkable. Birth rate of the 90 percentile and that's 53 and 75 percentile. OPC was 36, reflex is normal, heart rate normal, normal. Everything actually was normal in examination on delivery. I forgot delivery. I was, I was attending actually his uh, delivery in cesarean section in my hospital. Day three, the kidney. My detective next 65 per minute, more normal, suckling good, muscle tone normal, heart machinery remember, and it was done afterward and put to BBDA and the patient has cyanosis with desaturation. We did critical sample. Critical sample is where fasting blood glucose was 21 milligram per deciliter, insulin values was 11.8 micron per mil. And insulin glucose ratio was 0.56. And normal values is less than 0.25. Fasting C-peptide was normal. Serum lactate, 1.3. beta hydroxybutyrate 4.2 milligram per deciliter. Non-ketotic, cortisol was high or normal. ECTH was normal. Growth hormone normal. UMBH is 6. TSH and 3T4 cortisol, plasma renin, and aldosterone all were normal. Sepsis screen, there was element of sepsis, was not ophelia, and CRV was 48, blood gas were normal, calcium, ionized calcium, slightly low, sodium, mildly hyponatremic, and potassium, 5.9. Metabolic screen was normal. Urine organic acid, normal. Free fatty acids, normal. Actually, when I did carotiding, uh, it was 47XYY. And this is screening for glycogen storage disease. No glycogen storage disease as well. In the echo, BDA, transcranial ultrasound normal, the multi-slice CT for the abdomen was normal or unremarkable. Octotide started as 5 mic BKG every six hours, and blood glucose was controlled more than 60 milligram per deciliter, according to the European guidelines, or the guidelines it should be more than 63 milligram per deciliter. Breastfeeding was held initially, but resumed after all. It was breastfed and bottle fed as well, and the corn flour or corn starch was added. At six months, the dose of octotide decreased to 2.2 microgram per kg every eight hours. And the weight on the 50 percentile, that's on the 98th percentile, on the OPC on 50 percentile with normal developmental milestones. This baby, this patient, or this infant was macrosomic, so with blood glucose 21 milligram per deciliter, hypoglycemic, glucose infusion rate more than 50 milligram per kg per minute, failed to control the hypoglycemia, Increased fasting insulin, 11.8. And insulin glucose ratio, more than 0.5, and it should be less than 0.025. And there's non-ketotic, non no urinary ketones. And there was a rise or risk rise in blood glucose level in response to glucagon. Uh, diagnosis was congenital hyperacidism of infants based on this criteria. Actually, I did the molecular genetics in the lab, and, and it proves to be homozygous mutation was identified. And the mother and the father were consanguous, and it was heterozygous for the same defect. And as you see here, the gene was ABC8. So it is proved by molecular genetics as well. And finally, or it wasn't finally actually, it was years afterward, there was a so what's called octotide long acting release or octotide lard. And it was brought on octotide lard and it was doing extremely fine and maybe even the dose. This is a long acting one. Uh, it's doing excellent actually. 
with lower doses. And this while he was in the NICU, and this is uh, maybe perhaps six months, and this is when he's uh, nine, and this is more than nine. And this is actually, he passed the exam last uh, year, and he got uh, 90, more than 94 per, uh, percent in fifth degree. And actually, he was very happy. I didn't know actually when I have seen him the, for the first time how things is, will go on. I don't know. Yeah, for six milligram, I don't know for how long, what is the consequences. Actually, we don't know, but we did our best. This is the first one. The second one, 10 years now, non consequence parents uh, diagnosed at the age of seven months with hypoglycemia. And the parents are not. Uh, there's an episode of absent minded, or he's unable to concentrate or follow, or react to stimuli. His eyes were open and lasted, this condition lasted for 15 minutes. EEG was normal. There was severe hypoglycemia following meat and eggs, but not rice nor vegetables. Hypoglycemia was severe and associated actually with tonic clonic convulsions. It was non ketotic hypoglycemia, which responded to glucagon. Investigation done, lactate, uh, acylkinetin or normal, zone organic acid or normal, hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia. Uh, uh, on hypoglycemia, insulin level was 4.9. It should be less, less than that. It shouldn't be detectable. Ammonia was 100, between 100 and 150. And normal values was from 11 to 32. My, my uh, micromole per liter. So it was hyper, so it is hyperinsulinism, hyperammonemia, hypoglycemia syndrome. It is H H H S, and the patient was put on the side because the oxide was available at this time. But later on, things has been changed and has restricted protein in the diet. The work screen was normal. Its EEG was normal as well, and when we did a genetics for uh, analysis for GLUT1 gene, it's proved to be heterozygous mutation in GLUT1. But the mother was negative, but we didn't do it for the father. Now, afterward, he was put on the azoxide. Octotide was reduced and discontinued, and with the reduced protein intake, blood glucose value was normal. Now, he, uh, on the charge, it was the plan for the azoxide and started for the hypoglycemia, how to do that for hypoglycemia and severe hypoglycemia. If there is severe hypoglycemia, glucose or convulsions or conscious level is impaired or good function, he has to receive glucagon from 100 to 200 microbikg. Now he's 10.7 years now, and he's doing extremely excellent at school. Very successful, uh, young man, extremely fine. Another case, this patient has a mutation uh, in the gene, as you see here, uh, a gene type G1376R. And, and the patient was homozygous. And the, for this mutation, and the father and the mother were heterozygous for the same mutations. This patient, subtotal bancretectomy, he wasn't responding to any medication. Subtotal bancretectomy was done, but actually uh, he wasn't responding. It was very bad conditions. And this one, if you see this with macrosomic, uh, macroglossia, what do we think about it? This is Beckwith Vedman syndrome. I have my last patient. It's a very simple story. He came to me for uh, octreotide with the lab compatible with congenital hyperinsulin But Usually, I would like to investigate the patient at first 
that I met him, I can say for two weeks, and I stopped up to tide and no hypoglycemia and discharged in a good condition. He's, perhaps now he's six or seven years. Uh, this is a few of my uh, patients who is hypoglycemia and the response and the prognosis. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Thank you, Professor Samek, for this very nice presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, you can start, Professor. Yes, I have my, I have my. Yes, please. I, I should, oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Samek, for uh, this uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, talk about uh, hypoglycemia. As you as you said, that there, there is no specific level of uh, blood glucose which says that it, it will injure the brain. As you said, so okay, maybe 25 milligrams. So we, we need to keep above this. My question is uh, for those baby who, in case of asymptomatic hypoglycemia, which actually uh, it might come to 20, to, it's asymptomatic hypoglycemia. And uh, does it have does it have any effect on brain? So we we have to follow these babies up after that. This is my question because it's so frequent to find a case like this. May may please repeat the question again, Doctor Basumi. I'm talking about asymptomatic hypoglycemia. So I am following the baby, or mm. or whatever. Sometimes it may be not followed up at all. So do you get the bus, but at high, so with possibility that they will have brain injury because actually we don't have a, a, a line, or we cannot draw a line uh, beyond it or above, uh, below it, you can do, okay, this is the level where the brain can injure. So the, it, it is, yeah, they didn't have convulsion. So we, we are talking about asymptomatic hypoglycemia. Uh, so is there any uh, reason so to expect for this baby to have brain injury or that? Actually, I, I, I treat my patient uh, very conservative. And I usually, uh, I usually follow them up. And I never put the baby less than 35 milligram per deciliter, although the guidelines more than 25. But if, if, they are, if they are asymptomatic, I don't think we should investigate, except if we have maternal risk factors and serious ones, or neonatal risk factors. I don't know what do you think. I, I think uh, I, 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 this is my, my point because I'm, I'm, uh, there is a, a some recommendation to follow up those baby of at high risk of hypoglycemia, at least developmentally during their uh, 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 development uh, during the first year of five. So this is my question. Uh, okay, okay. I think uh, Dr. Amr uh, raised his hand as well. Dr. Amr. Hi, <laughs> hi, I'm Amr Shahid. I'm one of the It's uh, nice to meet you all, and thanks, Dr. Samah. That was a uh, very nice presentation. Uh, yeah, if I can comment on the question of from Dr. Reda about the um, neurological sequela of hypoglycemia, even if the patient is uh, asymptomatic. Um, I mean, uh, we don't routinely even do the um, the brain images to look for brain injury in asymptomatic uh, patients with hypoglycemia. But if the patient is symptomatic or developing, you know, jitteriness or seizures, definitely this baby deserve uh, to have uh, brain MRI uh, to look for the um, stigmata of hypoglycemic brain injury, which, as you know, usually happening in the occipital region. Um, but for a patient who is symptomatic, unless um, the patient is really having frequent hypoglycemic episodes, even though the patient is not symptomatic. Sometimes we do a brain MRI to look for um, uh, evidence of brain injury. And if you definitely have brain injury on the MRI, then this baby needs follow-up uh, later on. Um, it depends, again, you know, the neurological outcome, it depends upon the degree of the brain injury. If you have normal brain MRI, which is usually very uh, specific, um, so you would expect the outcome for this patient to be normal even though uh, if the patient even was symptomatic and having even seizures. But if the brain MRI is negative, then most likely this patient will be completely normal later on as the case you had, Dr. Sema. Uh, but if the patient is 
um, even though asymptomatic, but having a brain injury on the MRI, then according to the degree of the brain injury, you can anticipate the sequela, which can vary, as you know, from uh, extreme uh, spectrum of having cerebral palsy and motor affection uh, down to just visual uh, cortical visual impairment. Um, um, yeah, that would be my comment on that. Oh, oh, okay. What, what will be the appropriate time for MRIs in these cases? <clears throat> so, I mean, uh, this is like a debatable issue, uh, but if you really want to see the, uh, the evidence of acute injury of hypoglycemia, the energy failure secondary to hypoglycemia, you can do that within a frame of like seven days. Uh, Emily Tam, one of the neonatologists here in our group, uh, published paper showing that, you know, the diffusion restriction uh, on the diffusion weight images uh, of patients with hypoglycemia can disappear after one week of the event. So if you, uh, if you do the images later on, you might not see the evidence of acute injury and energy failure. Um, I mean, you might get some changes in T1 and T2 signals later on, but the acute, acute diffusion restriction, uh, classic uh, occipital injury usually happen within the first uh, one week of the, um, the instance of hypoglycemia itself. So. Okay, if there is any questions, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Professor Sema. And we move to the next speaker. Okay, that's uh, uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Amr Ahed. Uh, he uh, he is, uh, has been graduated from uh, Mansoura University as his master has master degree uh, in pediatrics and uh, his uh, PhD as well. Uh, uh, during uh, this time, he has completed his uh, fellowship, uh, medical fellowship in sick children, also of sick children, and he has also diploma of the medical education. Uh, uh, Amr has uh, uh, in Egypt for uh, quite some, quite some time. He was a core director of Egyptian Unital Network. Now he has uh, another fellowship in transport and then uh, Unital, uh, and the third one. In uh, neurology. Uh, he is now his assistant professor at the University of Dublin, Toronto. And he is the director, co director of the uh, neonatal uh, neurocritical care unit in neurology. Of preterm infant and the new was hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Uh, Dr. 